G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David, and each episode I like to bring in what I call best in breed. So whenever our guests come in, we like to have top talent and, uh, and what we'd call movers and shakers inside the property uh, property investing uh, space as well. So people that we feel that are really um, top of their game. Today's guest is someone that ticks all those boxes and more. And if you uh, have watched anything property investment related, you'd know the name Kent Lardner. Kent, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm well. Thank you for the invite. Mate, thanks for being here. Thanks for your time and always uh, uh, putting your hand up to share your knowledge and insights. Your knowledge and insights, I'm not going to give away your tenure, but you've got this um, long connection to the, the property space, the uh, investing space as well, data, and I feel like your growth, your trajectory has just been phenomenal with the um, with the tech, but also the, the human touch that you put behind it. Going, here's the information, but here's how investors or home buyers actually use this research data to make better quality decisions, which is something that we stand for as well. So, I also say thank you very much for for being here. And um, to kick us off, I usually what I call the three P's. So a bit about yourself personally, a bit about your professional journey, and. You can share a little bit about your bio, so don't be modest at all because I know your, um, your career has taken you to, across, the, uh, across the globe, actually, and um, many, many big organisations like JLL. And a bit about your own property journey because I know that you've moved out of Sydney and, and that type of change for you as well, mate. Yeah, yeah. So um, on the personal front, um, uh, my wife, Lee, I've got two kids, uh, Joel and Addie. Um, we moved up to Newcastle. Uh, so there, uh, my kids are 16 and 11. Um, we um, we d- did the exodus from Sydney r- rather early, and I- I'm noticing how common that is. That's why I relate so much to the exodus uh, that's yeah. going on that really turned up since COVID. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it was a-, a commutable location. It was something, it had a lot of similarities to San Diego. And I was, uh, back in the day, I was um, working for Gemworth LMI, um, started there in the late 90s. And um, uh, one of the functions there I was uh, managing the valuations uh, side of it as well as the underwriting. And what I, um, what I, one of the conferences we went to, we went over to San Diego and I thought, gee, this is, this reminds me so much of, um, uh, of Newcastle. Um, and then the housing market there was strong. A lot of people are exiting, um, uh, uh, getting out of LA and commuting up once a, once a week or whatnot. So anyway, so we moved up here. Um, one of the things that I've, uh, one of the reasons why I invested in Newcastle and I converted my investment property to our primary place of residence was that the LMI claims for three of the, the three large um, lenders up in the Hunter region had the lowest LMI claims, would you believe? Wow. Amazing low, hardly any claims at all. So the three best books in the country were from, from this part of the world. So I, um, I thought, well, yeah, okay, this is uh, going to be an interesting investment opportunity. Um, so my, my, my history in this space, I started out in mortgage insurance, fell in love with the property data they spent a bit of time and money sending me back to school to learn automated valuation models. Yeah. Back, back then, they wanted to diversify and move into to risk ratings and risk analytics and, and build out AVMs. Um, and uh, so they, they sent me back to school, sent me to Canada, sent me to the US, and I, I, I learned the ropes on how to, to build out AVMs. Um, there was a changing of the guard. The company went from being GE to Gemworth. They changed their mind on what they wanted to do with the AVM. So I started up with a, 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 a few members of the Ray White family, and we created a, a business called Price Finder. Yeah, which is revolutionary. <laughs> well, yeah, and back then it was it was scary, I've got to say, because yeah. I'd never done anything public facing like that. So um, to create some software to, that that was then you know, a, available for people to judge, that was intimidating. Mm. Um, and we didn't have access to a lot of the tools that we've got now, um, machine learning and, and a lot of the automated routines. So what we did is we set some scoring variables that matched comparable properties and then adjusted them if they were larger they got adjusted down if they're smaller they got just adjusted up uh, when comparing to the uh, subject property but the big thing that we created there was that user interaction you know that was that was the thing I loved is uh, how could I create an automated valuation tool that is user interactive so you can adjust for those quality differences and uh, and that uh, that was that was 
probably the thing that put put us on the map back then. Although the company, you know, of of its of, of its own back, even without that tool, did mm. really well in Queensland. Anyway, so from there, spent a few years there. We sold that to the Domain Group, and wow. then I moved over uh, to a company called CoreLogic. Yeah. and uh, uh, was head of their um, banking and analytics team. So their banking platforms, the valuation platforms, and analytics team. Um, and then they offered me a gig up in China. So I spent about just over a year up in China trying to set up with a partner, um, the equivalent of a core logic uh, in China. And then from there, moved over to Suburb Trends. Unreal. What a um, what a what an interesting journey you've had. I mean, you've probably seen from a few different perspectives, right? You've seen consumer side, you've seen B2B side, for example, as well, and but always around data property and what that means ultimately for for people like an investor like a mum and dad investor going well what does this actually mean for myself and my own portfolio as well yeah I, I think I'm very much on the risk side so you know most of if you think of my background I started out in that um, uh, space working with valuers and and on the on the mortgage side of it did have done a lot of work with companies like JLL and different valuation yeah. companies so I'm very risk centric in my my view of property data yeah yeah uh one of the questions i've got for yourself kenny's and you uh and we've seen it with a lot of you go back to the uh, early days of investing for example some in a hotel room for example and uh, i won't say spruiking but they were hosting seminars yes. and that kind of moved to maybe an online model which was some webinars or maybe some downloadables for example and then the next step was social um, and, you know, information giving and, and, and sharing to now tech and now it's really moved, like you said, machine learning and AI. Mm. This transition for investors has probably never been more information available to investors. It's mm. scary though. Um, I think that we've got some powerful tools in the hands of um, people with, without a lot of uh, depth and a lot of experience. And, and, you know, we can all access a product like Canva readily and then spin <laughs> up some beautiful looking uh, infographics and charts. And the problem is, um, you know, this, the Dunning-Kruger effect is you, you know, people give people just that little bit of, of, of taste of success. Um, and it's all been upside really for the last you know, yeah. several years. Um, you could almost say it's been 20 years of, of upside. Absolutely, yeah. And, and and the problem is pe these people haven't seen the dark side of the force. And so so they're presenting um, data as if it's gospel. And and if you study statistics, you always wrap it up in, I call them weasel words, you, you wrap things up in weasel words so you don't put your hand on your heart and say, this is a gold, this is a golden clad guarantee that this is going to happen. You never say that. And what I'm finding is that the people who can truly spruik and truly sell themselves and truly believe in themselves, they are brilliant marketers and they genuinely believe. Um, and that's great until it's not. Mm. And that's that's a big risk I'm seeing right now. Yeah. I mean, something it's something for people to do their own research about who their who their partners are, who they who they're looking to to get use whether it's buyer's agent, real estate agent. Um, but from your perspective, and you said you, you did your own due diligence same when you bought in, in Newcastle knowing what you know. So if you're talking to an investor, what are the data points, for example, that they should be looking at? What are the, how do they make a good quality decision without kind of analysis paralysis or wanting to go too deep? And then how do they make a decision with some type of confidence? Yes, absolutely. I, I think that the, uh, the analysis paralysis piece is an interesting point to maybe talk to first up yeah. in that the more variables you look at, the more the important variables can dilute. So you overcrowd your analysis. And, when, and if I build a scorecard, which I do, I need to be careful about what I include, what I focus on, because what you could do is if you focus, I'll pick on a very simple example. If I yeah. focus too much on yield, it could crowd out the things that matter for capital growth, et cetera. Um, so one of the biggest concerns uh, that we should all have is the top 10 growth suburb uh, yeah. stories that come out. And by virtue of those suburbs and the analysis of those suburbs being volatile, it's the volatility that puts them at the top of the top of the list. 
And then it's the same volatility that puts them on the other list six months later, which is the top, you know, the worst 10 suburbs. <laughs> so looking at growth alone in the short term has risks, especially uh, when you're looking at a very small sample set. And we'll talk about that as we go along. So some of the key things I like to look at, I like to look at the area, the, the wider area, the wider market. I call it the market. It's the SA3, Statistical Area 3. It's defined by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I'll just use the term ABS for now. Yeah. When you look at that SA3, you can look at how the whole market is doing and you can look at the, how that whole market is doing over time. What I like to do is look at how well it did before the boom. So effectively, we like, I like to look at how well that market did before boom times. That's an important one. It's just a variable. It's just something to look at yeah. and say, okay, you know, was this a really low growth market before the interest rates really got low and things really got hot? Um, so I look at that. I look at the short term because I think if you're representing a client and you're buying as for an investor, they need to know what the short term is likely to look look like, as well as the long term. You know, is this going to dip potentially in the next 12 months? So I think looking at the short term price change, the big leading indicators that I like, uh, number one, inventory. Uh, so what is inventory? Uh, inventory is an, al an analysis of how many listings there are and how many sales there are. And if you've got 100 listings and 10, listing and 10 sales per month, 100 divided by 10, that's 10 months of inventory. So um, <clears throat> I like to look at the trend of the inventory. Is it going down, i.e., uh, is, is demand outstripping supply? Or is inventory building? And it's the opposite. Um, and so you've got two key things when you're looking at inventory. You're looking at uh, what it is today in terms of how many months of inventory. If it's a very high number, it's a, a very strong buyer's market. Um, but if you have a very low number, which is kind of where we've been almost everywhere for the last two years, anything below two is a very strong seller's market. And a lot of markets are still coming off that. Are still, Even though that the trend is inventory levels building, we still have a lot of markets throughout Australia. Indeed, the majority of markets are still sitting below three or four months of inventory. Yeah. So we're coming off a very strong point. That's why I think the headlines are a little bit uh, fake at the moment. So that's the first leading indicator. The second leading indicator I really like to look at is uh, vacancy rates and the trend there. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, that, and that's, that kind of counters it from an, an investor's perspective. So one leads to price movement for, for sales and one leads to price movement, movement for rents. You mentioned that you call them lead indicators. Yeah. So again, I'll talk to a few clients. I'm like, what's a lead indicator? What's a lag indicator, for example? Because sometimes data can take a little while to actually catch up and then it does find its way onto a you know onto a website, for example, through a tool. So how do you know, how do you use that to become a lead indicator versus what's a lag factor, which might be, hey, look, auction clearance rates. That's what happened on the weekend, for example. And that's that's a little bit lag. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, uh, so if you do a correlation, these things are fairly weakly correlated when you try and put them in the, the typical X, Y axis and fit a line through it and come up with a, a goodness of fit. Uh, but it's there. Um, and it's, 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 it's a significant variable when you put it into a big model and you test it out, yeah. it usually performs quite well as a, as a variable of interest. Um, it typically... A, a, a significant change to inventory will have a flow on effect to prices in about four months. So typically when I look at lags, it's about a four month period before you see a significant shift in inventory impacting prices. So, and that makes sense because it takes time for settlements. It takes time for data to flow through, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, you, talk, you mentioned SA3, which I think I love how you find you're very big on this, you're very vocal in terms of the, the content you put out, the information you share is very big on SA3. People are going, well, what about SA1 and 2? Where, where do they fit into it? Yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah. These are good questions. So um, so let's talk about it for a moment. The, the Australian Bureau of Statistics has desi designed its own geographical boundaries. These boundaries are designed for one thing, for statistics. They're not designed for letterbox drops or post post you know like a <laughs> postcode yeah. um, they're not designed for, for for garbage collections like an LGA so so effectively the smallest unit they have is called a statistical area one I'll just call them SA SA1 SA2 so the smallest ones around give or take a couple hundred homes 
That's the smallest building block. And that plugs perfectly like a Lego building block into an SA2. And uh, they're, they're kind of a give or take about two to three suburbs big, if you think in suburb terms. And then that zooms out and goes into a, a, an SA3. Um, it's about 350 of those covering the country. And you find that the less populated ones are the bigger ones and the ones closer to the city with higher population density are the smaller ones. And then you go out to an SA4. So you know, where I live, for example, Newcastle and Lake Macquarie, that's an SA4. But when you go to the SA3 level, I've got Lake Macquarie West, I've got Lake Macquarie East, and I've got Newcastle, and they split it up into three. Um, coincidentally, the LGA for Newcastle and the SA3 for Newcastle are very, very close. But if you look at Brisbane, Brisbane broke everything in terms of using LGAs, which we used to use. So Brisbane became the blob and the blob monster grew and grew and grew and became this huge LGA, the size of a massive city. So the Gold Coast is another one. Brisbane is another one. These are LGAs that are too big to truly be useful. SA4s, I think, are equally too big to be useful, whereas an SA3 is the Goldilocks fit. Um, when we look at suburb trends, and we were fortunate to have a chat earlier um, and you talked about a case of what, what can someone use suburb trends for, for example, to start making some educated decisions. And one, one of the good points you raised was uh, if someone's looking to do a renovation, is this is this a project that I can embark on to make a return on, for example, you know, taking a three-better to a four-better, for example, plus a study, uh, again, so how does suburb trends then translate to making good quality, educated decisions using data? One of the features I have on there is called a price segmentation chart. Now, this is done at the suburb level. And uh, what it does is it tells you two things. It tells you what's the percentage of sales in each price bracket based on sales in that suburb in the last year on average. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, so what you can do by looking at the shape of that chart I can determine if it's a single market because it's a bell-shaped curve or if it's a bimodal market, if it's two, or if it's spread all over the place and very skewed one way or the other. And what you'll typically find, the beachside suburbs behave very, very weirdly. They look very odd. And typically there's two or three markets in one when you look at a suburb level distribution chart or price segmentation chart for a, for a beachside suburb. Um, when you look at normal suburbs or other suburbs, the more homogenous markets, they've typically got the peak in the middle. So the most common price brackets in the middle, and there's no other peaks. It just as a, a belt. And what this does is then tells you how reliable your median is at a suburb level. If you're looking at that from growth perspective or comparison, the median is the median. What you know, it, it is what it is. The middle value, but using that middle value for anything other than just a guide to say what do I expect to see if I go and buy a property there? That's one thing, but using it for growth and analysis is an entirely different thing. Um, <clears throat> so that's one use case. The second use case is looking at the price segment you're looking to buy in. And the a good example here is if I buy in the top price segment and I think that I can then do a $300,000 renovation and invent a whole new price bracket that's never been seen before for that suburb, there's a risk attached to that. Whereas if I buy something at the median or a little bit below the median, I can see where there's room to grow. I can see that there is a market for $1.3 million properties or $1.4 million properties. So buying a, an $800,000 fixer upper up and spending 300, I'm not inventing a new price bracket. So that's the, that's the simple use case for that. Yeah, I mean, you call it a simple use case, but I think that's incredibly valuable, especially when people are looking to maybe add value, for example. And I think when the market shifts, there'll be buying opportunities. So some people go, hey, look, especially with building you know, approvals, timelines to build, people want something fairly new. If you can get in there and renovate, add value, get it revalued, for example, you then know, uh, and I've, I've done this personally, out renovated a property for the market. Some of this, like this tool, would have been extremely helpful. Going, am I overcapitalizing when I go to renovate, or is this is there actual demand for this type of property as well? Yeah, exactly. And and you'll find, you know, this is a common problem that you find with mortgage brokers trying to get a valuation through for somebody <laughs> who's done a an over the top, you know, <laughs> and we've all seen it, right? And, yeah. and 
you know, how do, I, how do I get a valuation for 1.6? Well, you don't. <laughs> um, so I, I think, that, you know, the price segmentation is a, a terrific uh, tool for that. But in terms of opportunities now, uh, 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 anecdotal little stories, I've been creating these curated lists of, you know, suburbs in different price brackets, et cetera, um, for a website we've spun up called Suburb Help. And it's been really tough to create lists for the last few months. Mm. Um, and the, the, the lists I created or curated yesterday were a lot easier. So, so to the point, as, as listings start to build, um, it is creating opportunities. The headlines are a little bit, I think, irrational. They're, they're very clickbaity. But the reality is, a lot of markets will just flatline, but you still will have some panic selling, no doubt. Um, but what I can see now is it's it's uncovering opportunities from a data perspective, not some kind of wishy-washy statement, but the data is saying, wow, there's suburbs turning up now that, that were no listings in before a few months ago. <laughs> Suddenly I'm finding stuff. The other opportunity is within quality blue chip type suburbs, Suddenly, these streets you could hardly get access to, the pockets, the little gems, the golden triangles, they start to surface now. So the savvy people who can, can hold their nerve and have been through this before, don't pack it in, don't panic, uh, are going to have a rather in, enjoyable 12 months. Yeah, we just touched on there something which is, I mean, all the, all the reports around the market they're talking about Sydney and Melbourne properties <laughs> starting to decline a little bit. I'm like, it's not the Australian property market. In it's not show. one market. It's it, you know, I say it's 500 markets because it's mm. you know, it's it's 300 odd housing markets and 200 odd unit markets, and yeah. the rest are too small and too insignificant to call a market. But yeah, yeah so give or take, I say 500 housing markets, and um, uh, to call it an Australian housing market is is wrong. Yeah, well said. Um, we hear about location being like for an investor, it's like it's all about the location. Um, buy in the area, buy the particular suburb, for example, or corridor region, whatever you want to call it. Um, but there's a stat, when I've done research, I think it's almost two thirds of investors will buy close to where they live. Yes. So there's a real, what we call like a home bias, for example, it's maybe it's a flock to where I know, or, you know, I, my backyard's tending to do well, so I will buy here, for example, or it's a level of uh, comfort, knowing I can be close to where my investment property is. There's some that are just agnostic as to where this property is located around the country. Like yourself, you said, look, these are the markers for Newcastle. I think it's got good, um, I think it's got good hallmarks for growth. Bang, it makes it easy to invest. Um, how does an investor maybe use data to overcome, say, home bias or how they use that to make a decision that may take them out of that comfort zone, which is the areas close to home? Oh, it's, that, that's a really solid point. Uh, you know, the, the, the story that should frame it is, you know, investors don't put all their eggs in one basket in other categories or other asset classes, obviously. So, you know, obviously um, being able to focus on, uh, a spread of locations um, does the same or achieves the same thing. Um, so to your point about focusing or how to focus or how to influence uh, an investor to look at different areas, I think don't swamp them with too many choices. I think what I found when I've consulted with people just on the choice or the option, I've made the mistake of giving them 10 options of areas to look at. It's too many. So what I found is the sweet spot is give them three. Yeah, give them three SA threes that are a little bit different, and then get them to pick one, and then when they pick one, then give them three suburbs within that one SA three, and then they pick one. That seems to be the approach. So I, I think um, steering them to a, a another region is is easily done if you do it with a simplistic approach, and you've just got to keep the keep it simple. Keep um, just Profile the area, profile a few key points as to why the areas are of interest. Talk to the numbers. The, the numbers usually filter the areas to the top. That's what I work in. Uh, and then, yeah, talk to the attributes and the features and the assets that 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 you know make that area positive. Um, and then just don't don't swamp the investor with too many choices. Um, I think that's kind of that's the approach that I've taken. 
Oh, excellent. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Now, you don't strike me as a guy that sits still and, and just starts something and, and keeps going with this. I think you, you've always got something else that you're working potentially in the background. Are you able to share? With yeah, you? absolutely. I, so I was, I was focused very much on trying to create um, spreadsheets and sell spreadsheets to people um, at scale. And that kind of peaked and then it fell away. And it, I realized something wasn't quite right with that. Yeah. What I so you know, in that typical, you know, trying to find that what they call product market fit. I've been on that journey a lot with the suburb trend. So I've got some other business interests that just hum along, but yeah. suburb trends has been this thing that's out there for everybody to see, me changing my <laughs> my strategy. It's it's out there in the open. So the 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 spreadsheet approach just um wasn't um growing. It, it grew and grew and grew, and then it just petered out and then it fell back again. And I found some people sharing the files and a few things like that. Okay, it is what it is. But um, the thing that's really done well is um, curating or creating content, media content for, for clients. So I'm doing research, client, uh, research content for clients, white labeling it, and then pushing it out to media and building a really solid relationship with, with media outlets all over the country. And I do that in a partnership with a, a fellow by the name of Nick Bendell. He's a professional journalist, so I'm the data dude. He's the journalist. He knows what the media want. Yeah. And together we've formed a, a company called Real PR, and that's where I'm very focused. And um, doing that for a few mortgage lenders, a few prop tech companies, et cetera, and now creating content for a regional-based, um, say, property managers at a regional level, like an SA4, and yeah. get, getting content for them to, to, to push out to local media. We push it out on their behalf. So that seems to be the highest value thing I can do. And you know, sometimes you, you try different products and they don't come off the bat too sweetly or they, you, know, you hit them and they go, go out, outfield. Yeah. This, this particular thing came off the bat, bat rather sweetly from, from oh, getting very nice. Excellent. I think it's, it's that ability to go, hey, look, this is working, tweaking, moving forward, but you're making progress, right? I think it's, um, yeah. it's a real testament yeah. to yourself that you're not sitting still. And, and, and it's not about a commercial. It's not about trying to reverse engineer and going, I'm going to try and make some money. It's going, this is the data. This is what we've got. We've got good connections, relationships, reputation. Now going, how can we serve the market a little bit more? And people then take that and then you'll go to that next level as well. Yeah, yeah. how do I create value? That's kind of been my theme for yeah. this year is, is – if I'm creating value at one level, how do I add a love level? How do I level up on value for somebody? Yeah. And then, you know, how, how high can I push that? Yeah, excellent. Perfect. Mate, what we will do is we're going to include a link to Suburb Trends. We'll include all the details uh, about the projects that you're working on, which I think is super exciting. Um, but I want to really uh, share my gratitude to say thank you very much for your energy. Thank you for your insights, your knowledge. Um, I feel like you're one of these uh, one of these guests that we're going to bring back on because in a few months' time you've probably got something else um, that's going to be valuable for investors to keep their finger on the pulse, especially as we go through more changes in this market. So this the, the data that you've got is going to radically probably look very different to what we've had for the last 12, 18, 24 months as well, isn't it? Yeah, it does. And look, we've got the suburb map is there. So that's something uh, uh, that's been consistent with whatever I've done on the monetization of the site. I've kept the suburb map there and that's free and available for everyone. Click through the different icons and you view all the different data sets. What I've done is I've changed from a rolling 12-month median for the SA3 data to a 90-day. It's yeah. introduced a little bit of a wobble. But it's capturing some of these these up you know trends up to date trends. So we are seeing a number of areas start to change fairly significantly right at this time. Fantastic, Ken. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. And thank and you. Thanks, Aaron. Ken, wonderful. Yeah. All right. If you found that helpful, please uh, leave us a review or drop a comment if you've got some other questions for myself or Kent. We'd love to answer those in the future as well. And um, that's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I've been your host, Aaron. We're joined by Kent. We'll chat to you soon. Thanks.